When someone today says computer, one typically thinks of your standard laptop, MacBook, or even cutting edge desktop costing thousands of dollars. However, the term computer once referred to an individual who would compute calculations. Typically speaking today, computer now refers to a device that can be programmed to carry out these calculations automatically. Computers have existed for thousands of years, only becoming the cutting edge devices we are used to today very recently. Early forms of computers did not involve microprocessors or integrated circuits, as these are only inventions of the late 20th century. The abacus, invented in the Middle East before 500 BC, remained the fastest computing device until the mid-17th century. In 1642, at age 18, Blaise Pascal, a French scientist philosopher, invented the first mechanical calculator, the Pascaline. The Pascaline made use of interlocking cogs that added and subtracted decimal numbers. Decades later, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz developed a similar device, the Leibniz machine, utilizing a stepped drum. Step drums were used in calculators for almost another 300 years. This machine could also multiply, divide, and work out square roots. Although Leibniz didn't make use of binary, he was the original creator of this form of code. In 1854, George Boole used the concept of binary code to invent Boolean algebra. It is this form of mathematics that allows computers to make decisions by comparing long strings of binary code. However, it would still be another century before mathematicians and computer scientists would figure out how to actually accomplish this. Abacuses as well as mechanical calculators both lack one critical concept that makes them calculators and not full-fledged computers. Automation. It wasn't until mathematicians and scientists devised ways to program calculators to carry out these operations autonomously that calculators evolved into computers. Charles Babbage attempted a device capable of completing calculations via execution of programs in the 19th century with the vision of processing tedious military calculations to help artillery soldiers aim more accurately. Despite none of his machines ever being completed during his lifetime due to lack of funding and resources, he is known as the father of the computer. The machines he designed were the first ones capable of taking input data, storing this data for processing, and then outputting the data. Eventually, Babbage began working with Augusta Ada Byron, Countess of Lovelace, who was an enthusiastic mathematician. She worked to perfect Babbage's ideas of programmability for his device. Due to this, she is often known as the first computer programmer. She is also seen as a prophet of computer science as she was the first to believe that modern computing would be able to represent not just numbers, but images and sounds as well. Towards the end of the 19th century, other inventors were much more successful in completing computing engines than Babbage was. In 1880s USA, it took seven and a half years to analyze the census data by hand. An American statistician, Herman Hallreth, built the world's first practical calculating machines, a tabulator, to compile census data. This rapidly increased the speed at which census data could be collected and analyzed. In 1896, Hallreth formed the Tabulating Machine Company to manufacture these machines for the public. Eventually, this company became known as International Business Machine in 1924. In the 20th century, U.S. government scientist Vannevar Bush began designing many extremely complex analog computers. One of which, the Rockefeller Differential Analyzer finished in 1935, was comprised of 320 kilometers of wire and 150 electric motors. These machines were deemed analog calculators because they stored numbers in physical form. These machines were capable of carrying out very complex calculations. However, it took them several days to process them. The Rockefeller wasn't Bush's only contribution to the field of computing in the 20th century before World War II ended. In 1945, Bush theorized of a memory storing and sharing device called Memex. Memex eventually came to fruition in the form of the World Wide Web, designed by Tim Berners-Lee decades later. Alan Turing was a notable pioneer in the field of computing during the 20th century. Turing was a Cambridge mathematician who contributed many theories to how computers processed information. At the age of 23, Turing wrote his paper on computable numbers with an application to the Entscheidungs problem. In this paper, he described a theoretical computer, which eventually came to be known as a Turing machine. Due to his theories, he is often regarded as the father of modern computing. Turing was not only a theoretician. He played a critical role in developing code-breaking machinery that broke the German Enigma device's encryption. After the war, he played small roles in the development of many different experimental computers, such as the Automatic Computing Engine, the Manchester Ferranti Mark I, and Colossus. His everlasting contribution to the world of computing comes in the form of the Turing test. This can be utilized to deem if a computer can be considered intelligent by seeing whether it can sustain a conversation with a human being. The late 30s and 40s were an exciting time in the field of computer science with powerful computers beginning to appear. In 1938, 
German engineer Konrad Zeus constructed his Z1, the world's first programmable binary computer. A year later, American physicist John Atnasoff and electrical engineer Clifford Berry built a more elaborate binary machine named the ABC. The ABC was 1,000 times more accurate than the differential analyzer. These were the first machines that used electrical switches to store numbers. Since these machines stored digits, they were the world's first truly digital machines. The first large-scale digital computer appeared in 1944 at Harvard University, developed by a mathematician Howard Aiken and sponsored by IBM. Known by two names, either the Harvard Mark I or the IBM Automatic Sequence Controlled Calculator. This giant machine stretched 15 meters in length. Data was stored and processed using 3,304 electromagnetic relays. However, the relays were slow due to their size and required large pulses of power to switch the relays from one position to another. Most devices from this time period were built for military purposes, often to calculate artillery firing tables, similar to what Babbage had envisioned of his engine centuries before. These devices were an important stepping stone into the world of modern computing. The ENIAC machine, developed by John Motchley and J. Pressburg Eckert, are said to be inspired by one of Bush's differential analyzers, albeit much more ambitious. ENIAC is recognized as the world's first fully electronic, general-purpose digital computer. Colossus would have qualified for this title as well, but since it was designed for only code-breaking and cannot store a program, it couldn't be easily reprogrammed for other tasks. After ENIAC came the Electronic Discrete Variable Automatic Computer, designed by Eckert Motchley Computer Co. and John Von Neumann. EDVAC laid the groundwork for how all modern computers operate. This was followed by Eckert and Motchley developing UNIVAC-1 with the help of Grace Murray Hopper, who previously worked for Howard Aiken on the Harvard Mark I. UNIVAC-1 eventually became the world's first large-scale commercial computer. The microelectronic revolution came about as a result of unreliability of vacuum tubes and unsustainability of the technology. As computers were getting more powerful, the number of tubes increased dramatically. ABC had 300, while Colossus had 2,000, followed by ENIAC at 18,000, which also used 2,000 times as much power as a modern computer. It became evident that this could not be sustained as more and more computing power would be needed by the military. The solution to this problem came to light in 1947 at the hands of three physicists, John Bardeen, Walter Bertain, and William Shockley, working for Bell Labs. They believed it would be possible to make a more effective amplifier out of semiconductor materials such as silicone or germanium. Eventually, they developed a device known as a point contact transistor. Due to conflicts between the physicists, only Bardeen and Bertain were awarded the patent for the transistor. This led Shockley to develop the junction transistor on his own, which became the basis of most transistors ever since. These devices had numerous advantages over vacuum tubes. Being a fraction of the size of vacuum tubes, more energy efficient, and virtually 100% reliable. Eventually, the physicists all went their own ways with Shockley forming his own company, Shockley Transistor. Shockley then set out to hire the best minds in the USA. However, it did not take long for his employees to become fed up with his management style, who eventually left the company and started Fairchild Semiconductor. This started the growth of the Silicon Valley in California. The next breakthrough in the field of computing occurred simultaneously at Fairchild as well as Dallas Labs, Texas Instruments. The problem with machines making use of many transistors was the need to wire them all together by hand, which was extremely taxing, error-prone, and expensive. Jack Kilby at TI theorized that it would be possible to have multiple transistors in one package. Eventually, Kilby invented the integrated circuit, a collection of transistors and other components that could be manufactured all at once in a block on a semiconductor. This was a step forward, however the components of the integrated circuit still had to be connected by hand. Unknown to Kilby, Robert Noyce of Fairchild in California found ways to include the connections between components in an integrated circuit, thus automating the entire process. Integrated circuits work to shrink computers to wieldy sizes while boasting more processing power and greater cost effectiveness. Eventually Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore left Fairchild and formed Integrated Electronics, or Intel. Originally setting out to make memory chips for pocket calculators, their engineers realized it would be possible to make universal chips that could be programmed to work for all devices. With this theory came the microprocessor. Next came personal computers. By 1974, Intel launched a microprocessor known as the 8080. Computer hobbyists were building home computers around it. The first was the Midas Altair 8800, built by Ed Roberts. While it was nowhere near what one considers today when they think of a computer, he earned a fortune selling thousands of them. Steve Wozniak, inspired by the Altair, developed his own computer, Apple One.
Wozniak's friend, Steve Jobs, convinced him they should go into business making and selling Apple Ones. Eventually, the Apple Computer Corporation was formed in Steve Jobs' parents' garage. After selling 175 Apple Ones, they built the more advanced Apple II. What the Altair 8800 and Apple I lacked was made up for in the Apple II. They took inspirations for its design from many everyday objects such as stereos and TVs. This was the world's first home microcomputer. Eventually the devices were being bought by the tens of thousands after their potential to store and analyze data was realized. To combat Apple's success, IBM launched a campaign to produce a streamlined computer similar to Apple II. This took shape in the form of the IBM Personal Computer based on an Intel 8080 microprocessor. The PC found success due to one key factor. All the microcomputers of the 70s, including the Apple II, all utilized different hardware and worked in different ways using its own version of the basic programming language. Due to this, programs wrote for one machine would not work on another. In 1976, Gary Kildall created a solution to this problem. Kildall wrote an operating system, CPM, that acted as an intermediate between the user's program and the machine's hardware. This would make all the different microcomputers compatible. By the early 80s, Kildall had become a multimillionaire. It would make sense that IBM would approach him when they were creating their personal computer. However, Kildall refused to sell IBM his operating system for 200000 stating that it was worth millions. IBM then turned to another programmer, Bill Gates. His then small company, Microsoft, created an operating system called DOS. Due to this, the IBM PC was a major success. However, IBM's victory was short-lived due to Bill Gates only selling one form of DOS to IBM, PC-DOS, while retaining a similar version of MS-DOS. When other companies started manufacturing computers, such as Compaq or Dell, they also came to Gates for software. Largely, the winners were Microsoft and Intel, who now supplied the software and components for most of the computers on the planet. However, at this time, all computers still ran based on text. After a visit to Palo Alto Research Center, Steve Jobs was introduced to the Xerox Alto. The Alto had a desktop screen with picture icons that could be manipulated by a mouse. This was the first GUI. GUIs are now used in almost every modern computer. Jobs then released the Apple Lisa in 1983 featuring a GUI at a price of $10,000, three times the cost of an IBM PC. This device failed but later paved the way for the Macintosh computer that Jobs released one year later. Desktop driven, the Macintosh was a critical success. Howard did not take IBM out of the lead in the world of computing. However, IBM lost its place at the top after Bill Gates saw the Macintosh's desktop operating system. He then designed Windows, an upgraded form of MS-DOS with a GUI. Apple was not pleased with this and filed a claim at $5.5 billion for copyright infringement. However, this eventually fell apart and Microsoft secured the right to utilize a GUI in all future forms of Windows. This brief outline by far does not encompass all the milestone markers in the fields of computing, not to mention the internet, but rather provides a quick explanation of how far the field of computer science has come since its humble beginnings in 500 BC with the creation of the abacus.